Hello, it's uh, Paul Beck with again, and uh, this video is a continuation of the previous one where I'm discussing a recently published paper called The Trajectory Towards a Seasonally Ice-Free Arctic Ocean. So it looks at the observations and it looks at the models and it looks at the dependencies of Arctic sea ice on global mean surface temperature and also on cumulative emissions or the, love, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And it determines that the probability of no sea ice um, based on the deterministic plus the um, internal variability of the system plus the feedbacks means, uh, you know, you, you're, we're looking at numbers something like between 12.5 years and 27.5 years. This is, this is uh, according to the, the paper. Um, I think it will be faster than that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm talking about the, you know, what, what the results of this study showed. So I'll just continue where I left off uh, previously. So this paper is open source, so just Google it and you can uh, easily find it. And uh, I've got it open here. So talked about, we, de we determine what the sea ice is doing from observations and also we fit models to the present behavior and those models have been challenged to come up with the decent um, decent uh, trajectory of the sea ice um, and there are there are limits to the so for in terms of the observational records they're not perfect either there's three distinct limitations the first is internal variability the climate system's chaotic Okay, there's an infinite number of possible climate trajectories, but only one of those is actually realized and can be observed. One of them happens in reality. So because of that, you have limited insights into the impacts of external forcing or internal variability just from the observations. Okay, the second limitation is from observational uncertainty because all satellite records are based on indirect methods to determine an underlying sea ice property like area or extent or even volume, you know, thickness, you need to get volume. All major observational products are an approximation of the true state of the sea ice cover at any given time. And their accuracy um, can, will of course vary during the season. It can be very, you know, generally it's much better in the winter and when you get the ice melting and melt ponds on top of the ice, that decreases, can decrease or um, decrease the accuracy of the measurement. And the third limitation is, is that we're only, we only observe a limited subset of climate variables that matter for the evolution of sea ice. For example, you know, we have limited observations of major atmospheric heat fluxes that determine the surface energy balance. We don't have a lot of information on oceanic heat flux under the ice, which melts the ice from below. Okay, so there's all of these challenges. So the, the most robust assessment estimate to future ice cover would be a, are, are based actually on the linear relationships that are observed between temperature or cumulative CO2 emissions and sea ice coverage and this is identified in both models and observations. So the observations, it's mostly a 40 year long record from 1979 to the present of gridded Arctic sea ice concentration as obtained by passive microwave satellite observations. And we, you know, these satellites, we can get this data, you know, during the polar night and also uh, through cloud cover because there's a big difference in the microwave emissivity, how much energy is emitted between open water and ice. So we can determine accurately open water versus ice, except when there's water on top of the ice, this can throw things off. So satellite observations are relatively robust during the winter, but once the melt begins, the sensitivity of the microwave emissivity to liquid water at the sea ice surface, so water on top of the ice, that can result in large underestimations of the true sea ice fraction. In other words, satellite can think, hey, this is water, because there's water on top of the ice, 
you know, and miss the, you know, not, not have the true picture. So near the ice edges and in, and in coastal regions, the large satellite footprint, the large grid size, can give you false ice concentrations. So this study is looking, uh, the study is looking at sea ice area or sea ice extent. Now, um, of course, extent is defined as anything with at least 15% sea ice coverage. So if you have a large enough grid size, you know, you, you can say, okay, this is ex included in extent. So it depends somewhat on grid size, but if the, if you use, the paper uses the term sea ice coverage, and that's any statement that's true for both sea ice area and for sea ice extent. Okay, now the models. Now, at the last video, um, or not the last one, but the previous to last, was on the models, uh, sea ice and under CMIP 6 models. Okay, so it's sort of an update. This paper, when this paper was written, um, it was on C, CMIP 5 models, but there's not a lot of difference between them. Okay, so models. So climate models cannot capture all processes that govern the evolution of our climate system and hence usually represent the real evolution of an observable, less realistically, le less realistically than a given observational record. So, so observations are, are, are key, you know, and that's what's going on. And you try to get the model to, to work up to now in terms of the observations realized so far and then to make a projection into the future. But there's substantial biases um, in the models. Models generally have the sensitivity is too low. Um, so there's so for a given warming, uh, the amount of ice lost in practice, in reality, exceeds what that which comes out of the model. Okay, same thing with simulated CO2 emissions. Okay, um, for 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 given emissions. The ice is generally, uh, you know, the loss of ice is there's not enough ice lost in the model compared to the reality. There's a the distribution of ice thickness is not great, and there's also biases in the al albedo, the reflectivity of the ice because the ice, you know, because, again because of the water ponding on the ice and the the snow, you know, melting on top of the ice, etc. And those things are more there's more air, a lot more air in the summer. Okay, now once you get a result from a model, sometimes it's hard to get, show the relationship of the model to the real world, okay, to infer a robust quantitative statement. So internal variability renders a perfect agreement of a model simulation with reality, but pretty much impossible, okay? Um, so what you need to do is you need to take the internal variability into account due to the climate, you know, being a chaotic system, so an agreement of a specific model with some observed record does not indicate a reasonable description necessarily of the underlying process. The model just might be lucky. Um, you tune the model uh, to match observational records and there might be errors that compensate for each other, etc. And agreement of a model with past evolution of an observable like sea ice coverage is not necessarily an indication of a reliable projection in the future. But models, uh, you can run them many times. You can run them over long periods. These are pluses, and you can capture the range of possible internal variability by, you know, basically changing the input boundary conditions slightly and seeing what the model tells you. And the model can give you, you know, a three-dimensional picture of all the major climate variables at any desirable, desired temporal resolution. So we can get important insights into the evolution of ice cover that can't be inferred from the observational record. So for about 40 different climate models that were used in CMIP 5, more recently in CMIP 6, and some models, some ensembles of simulations. So you can just run an individual model that seems to be decent many, many times with slightly different input conditions to find out what the internal variability will be. Okay, now what's causing the ice to be lost? Changes in the external forcing have been established as a major driver of the observed loss of sea ice. Okay, um, and internal variability may have amplified the loss of sea ice. Okay, so what's happened in the past? Okay, so past evolution of the sea ice cover. We look at the observations and the simulations, and they both show that the 
Arctic sea ice coverage, i.e. the sea ice area or the sea ice extent, during summer is linear relate, linearly related to the rise in global mean temperature. Okay, so now because the temperature depends on the emissions, the, or the, the atmospheric CO2 concentration, and also the cumulative anthropogenic CO2 emissions, that the, there's a linear correlation between the evolution of Arctic summer sea ice and these two factors too. Okay, um, and not only does this hold in the summer, but it holds for all months, both for temperature and cumulative CO2 emissions. Now, when you do a regression, we talk about an R squared value, and the R squared value ranges between 0.75 and 0.92 for every month of the year over the period 1953 to 2017 for the sea ice. So the pre, you know, 1953 to 1979 would be the pre-satellite era. Okay, uh, it also found that um, there was no substantial covariation of Arctic sea ice with changes in solar activity, sunspots, okay, um, and large observed volcanic eruptions such as El Chichen in 82 and Mount Pinatubo in 91 only caused a small increase in the sea ice coverage, okay, only caused some cooling. Uh, but not a huge difference. Couldn't be picked up in an individual model, but could in the ensemble. So the natural changes in the forcing, external forcing, have not played a major role for the evolution of the Arctic sea ice cover. Now, this is key, especially given the coronavirus and aerosols. Anthropogenic aerosols have been of limited importance for the evolution of the Arctic sea ice in recent decades, but this is because their abundance has remained largely unchanged in the recent past. Okay, which is why it's unlikely that there, the change, which has been small, has contributed much to the rapid loss of sea ice evolution. But with the coronavirus, aerosols way, way down. Um, you know, this is an experiment in progress to see, you know, how this affects the, the sea ice evolution. So how do we find out what the sea ice cover is going to do? We can use the linear relationship between global mean temperature and Arctic sea ice coverage that's pretty constant. And, uh, you know, we can just carry it forward and, and see how the sea ice disappears. So, so we can talk about the sensitivity of the Arctic sea ice coverage to global mean temperature and also to cumulative CO2. Now, the, um, also, uh, you know, we can look at the... Um, we can define a near ice or practically free Arctic Ocean as being when the total sea ice coverage drops below 1 million square kilometers. Now the average sea ice extent during September is about 4.7 million square kilometers and the average sea ice area during September is about 3.3 million square kilometers. That's over the last 10 years. So to go reduce to below a million square kilometers, it's about plus 0 0.06 to 0 0.09 relative degree temperature rise relative to the average global mean temperature of the past 10 years. So currently we're above one, so the Arctic Ocean can be expected to have an average ice coverage of less than a million square kilometers during summer for less than two degrees Celsius of global warming. So here's some of the data. You can base it on sea ice extent or you can base it on sea ice area. And the sensitivity in terms of millions of square kilometers change per degree Celsius or degree Kelvin. And that gives you a temperature rise of 0.6 in one study, 0.8 in another study. And if you base it on sea ice area, you get from between 0.6 and 0.9. So if you take between 0.6 and 0.9 temperature rise, we can expect to be ice free in September. Okay, so there's a robust relationship. So as soon as the global mean temperature is risen by slightly below 2 Celsius, the Arctic Ocean is expected to be, on average, nearly ice-free during September. And we can also look at the um, seasonal cycles of the ice, like in other months. And that linear relationship is found to apply in other months as well. So on average, I we'll have an ice-free Arctic Ocean throughout August and September for an additional 800 gigatons of anthropogenic CO2. That's three meters squared loss of sea ice area per ton of CO2 emissions. 
And it, with 1,400 gigatons, Arctic would be sea ice from July to October. Thanks for listening. I'll continue.